So the title of the presentation is Living with Big Mother and uh, before starting off I'd like to share some of my background and if this thing is working, okay, this is me actually, seven years old and I was always fascinated even in my early days about artificial life because even as a young guy I, I, I imagined that my future would be somewhere related with machines, that machines would help me. I'm quite lazy by nature so it fits right into my profile. So. Back then, my, my, my image on, on robots or artificial life consisted of, you know, wrapping up some cardboards and uh, attaching a cassette player to it. And actually, my parents stopped me from doing this because uh, they saw me going after the television set with a couple of screwdrivers and a hammer. So I needed to change my direction. So fast forward to um, like 30 years later, uh, a little bit later, and I'm going too fast, is that we're now living in this world where it's noisy. It's noisy, I mean, uh, the last couple of years have been quite noisy because we're filled with social networks. We're generating data, generating data at the rate of like, we generate every year twice the data that we generated like 5,000 years ago. I mean, you know, can you start to imagine what, what this is? And this is basically the, the situation I'm in, personally. I don't know about you guys, but this is it. Uh, I don't understand it anymore. I don't even know why I'm still on Facebook. I don't even know why I'm still on Twitter. Um, it's overload. And if you look at search engines as well, try typing I'm hungry or I want to have fun stuff, I'm getting like a gazillion number of results and I'm not interested in it. It's not helping me. So actually what we've built is this beast, this monster of the internet, which I refer to as the brain. It's like a centralized brain and we humans are carbon units, nothing here, but connecting to the internet, uploading our ideas and then we die off and that's it. So there's this huge brain, there's this internet thing and it's overloaded with information and if you look at our capacities of how can we process that information, it's pretty obvious that the carbon units clearly are outnumbered in terms of the capacities that silicon units have, like, you know, computers, as we'd call them, or smartphones, which is actually the topic of uh, my talk today. So clearly, we need to accept that the next couple of years and for the rest of our lives, we need to embrace actually machinery. We need to embrace cognitive agents. And while though I was seven years old, I was building my own little version of robots, I, I had to re-establish that image and confront myself with perhaps it's not going to be a robot, although I, I really love to have a robot, and if I'm correct, we will all have one. <laughs> but I think there are some steps in between being smart agents, cognitive agents, pieces of software that live on devices that we hold in our pockets, like a smartphone, that will continue to help us digging through all that data. And digging through all that data is needs to be data that's relevant to me. So if I'm surrounded by all that data and by all the information, I'm connected with a gazillion number of friends on Facebook and on Twitter, why am I still feeling isolated? Why am I still, you know, not getting the data I deserve? And in terms of personalization of data, we already have one big problem. Uh, people tend to brag. We tend to lie. Little white lies, big black lies, but we lie. And, you know, we all know this meme. Uh, there are you know, plenty of them. But human-generated data tends to be unreliable. And this is more of like an anthropological point of view. When you want to get established correct data, you need to observe, not really um, no, ask someone to do it. Uh, who's seeing the dog, by the way? <laughs> and also side effect of humans is that, you know, we clearly lack the intelligence or uh, we lack the skills to build and add context. It also applies to data. When you get data without context, it's just dumb. It's stupid. It doesn't mean anything. So we need to have, find a way to generate context as well. So the point of my startup and what we're aiming at is we're doing research and building some prototypes in which we try to build rich data. Rich data consisting of you know, human-generated data, like your Facebook wall posts, uh, your tweets, and so on, but add it with rich data, being uh, observed data. We also want to observe who you are. So take a minute and think about 
observing people. Um, clearly, um, outsourcing this task to an observer, to a human that's following you, is you know, not scalable. So what else of means do we have to observe your, what you're doing? We all have it already. We have this smartphone thing, right? So, if I'm going to, you know, tweet, for example, hey, I'm in TEDx Leuven today. Uh, this is human-generated data. Another layer of that data could be, you know, I'm a male, and detecting a male or female is possible due to the different bounds in the gyroscope, you know, sensors in your smartphone. Um, I'm positioned in this, and this is actually Canipolis and I'm facing northeast direction, blah, blah, blah. This is a second level of observed data, which already gives some more richness to the upper level. And then we go even deeper down. When you look at deep data mining, you would see that I've attended some TEDx conferences, for example, and this might indicate I'm quite of a TEDx fan. Data that otherwise we shouldn't have, you know, we didn't have access to. So this is clearly the results of deep data mining and adding sensory data to otherwise human-generated data. So that's why when we talk about smartphones, I'm not really looking at that phone to make a phone call or send an SMS, but I'm looking at more as an interconnected sensory device. And this sensory device has multiple sensors built in when you, you know, when you're breaking up your smartphone, you could see this. And I'm not going to run through all over this, but anyone using Foursquare, who's used Foursquare, anyone else, I guess, right? we're only using this one sensor. It's called you know, the GPS. So actually, even there, we're at the forefront. We're at the beginning of a whole disruptive market of apps that will take your sensory input and start proposing you with stuff that makes actual sense. And when you compare my, my seven-year-old image on a robot and map it to sensors, we see that, well, pretty much all of the sensors are also in the robotics. And comparing them to smartphones, it's pretty much the same. The only thing that, that's different is, of course, robots have more gyroscopes and have more, you know, because they need to move autonomously and prevent them from bumping into walls. Well, that's something that smartphones have outsourced to us humans. You just take care, I'm done, not bumping into walls, I'm going to provide you intelligent data. I can live with that. So, what we believe in, or what I believe in, and I think that's going to be shown in the next couple of years, is that your smartphone will be your preferred platform or your delivery channel as, as a cognitive agent. And we can already see some, you know, some things happening in that industry. There are different play fields. The first of one, some, some experimentation is still need doing, uh, be needed to be done is machine learning and deep data mining. And this is where actually we already have the machine, like the, the cell phone, but now it's off, up to us to put the machine in, you know, the ghost into the machine. We need to create the soul of the machine. And that's possible. That's very much possible when you look at the machine learning algorithms that even we have been developing in our, in our small office, which allows us actually, and this is a shameless plug for the application we're building, um, is actually that we can, um, for example, determine your gender without you telling us. Uh, I explicitly said sex because also with a gyroscope, you could detect some sexual activity when you're having your <laughs> smartphone on your body somewhere. But also is um, determining, <laughs> for example, your sleeping patterns. I mean, if your cell phone is on a standstill for like five to six hours during nighttime and we've been, we know that you have been active because of the gyroscope bounces and because of the light sensor for the past eight hours, chances are likely that you might be asleep. A feature that apps like Pod still require you to explicitly state, but actually we could already determine this automatically for you. Um, and also when you do um, geomapping and heat map analysis, you could see, well, this guy is always moving to that place, which is most likely his home, but between 8 and 12 o'clock, he's always spending lots more time on other people's homes. Perhaps that also gives you an idea of the marital loyalty you have. But the side effect that we've seen from our research is that we could start doing some very vague search queries. Ever try to enter I'm hungry in Google? How many results you get that's really relevant to you? Not many, right? But with these affinity networks that we've been building, you could actually ask very vague search queries and get quite accurate results, which is quite cool, which also can change the way we search for data, the way we sift through that giant brain we call the internet. 
Um, the second play field is making your interaction easy. And indeed, I was happy to see that someone else also noticed the small little revolution we've seen with Siri. Uh, everyone was, you know, applauding when the iPhone came out, but I didn't see the same response when Siri came out. While that Siri thing was, you know, that was remarkable. The way we deal and talk with our machines is the next step we need to circumvent. And obviously there are, of course, you know, some errors still in this uh, field. There's still a lot of experimentation to be done. Uh, obviously Microsoft Tell Me is not doing a good job at voice recognition. And this video is never going to be posted on TEDx <laughs> because of this. And the third thing is when, we, when we're talking about putting the soul in the machine, it also means that your cognitive agent needs to develop a super ego. A super ego is not meaning that he's going to be arrogant and brash. No, it means that he has a rule set. He has a strategic planning rule set that prevents other interactions from um, stopping him performing his uh, activities. For example, in the case of HAL 9000, everyone saw the movie, right? And the HAL thing, uh, in one moment, Dave wanted to shut him down. He was like, no, sorry, Dave, I cannot allow you to do this. This is actually a super ego intervening in Dave shutting down the machine. In this case, it means that also our cognitive agents, so that we'll be living on our smartphones, will be designed to help us really improve our quality of life without other uh, distractions. Now, we can always see, we can also see that um, the next waves are coming and also always a very good indicator is to look at how, how venture capital is flowing into innovation. And right now we see that a lot of startups, it's a crowded space, many investors like to, in, to be in, terms specifically in terms of you know, tag-based affinity networks and implicit social networks. So while Facebook is an explicit social network because there's a zero and one connection between you and your friends, implicit social networks actually take a more granular approach because one day you might be a friend of each other the next day you might be an enemy. Implicit social networks, very interesting where venture capital is flowing into. But the second wave is well, when there will be more of computer, computer linguistic analysis on tweets, for example, to determine emotion, emotional states of groups of people, deep data and artificial net neural networks that are coming into our smartphones as well. But the challenges are clearly still there for us to, to solve. And specific terms is battery life. Once we were uh, experimenting with our sensors, we drained the battery in three hours' time. So clearly, that's not a good thing. But also the user interface and the sensory accuracy is still not there. But this also has an impact on how we look at society and on our own existence as human beings. Uh, and this first guy, you know, Copernicus, um, that was a guy who said, well, actually, it's no longer a geocentric model, but the heliocentric model that we have. So, tough luck, you know, we're not the unique pieces of, you know, the unique snowflakes that we pretend to be, and our Earth is not the unique floating ball into space. So, hmm, well, then, if the Earth isn't central anymore, hey, perhaps the humans are still, you know, special. Well, then this Darwin guy thing came along and said, well, hmm, actually, uh, we're a bit off. We're nothing but a mutation, which is still ongoing. Um, so that puts us in another difficult position. Well, if the earth isn't, specific, isn't special and our bodies aren't even special, wait a minute, our minds, our minds still are special. So that's, well, we still have this. Well, this Freud thing and uh, Spencer and Jung got into play and also saw, sought out that there's consciousness, subconsciousness, and actually that our minds are not really the minds of our own. So, you know, we've, we've come a long way in our existence to learn that we're not unique. And I think the, the final path that will take us is cognitive agents or, robot or robots, but cognitive agents specifically, and teach us that, well, in order to continuously um, process all the information and the data and to improve our quality of life and even support our very existence and our survival in the long run, we need to embrace machinery and smart agents. A side effect that, of course, all this gives is that we have become a very panopticonic society. And a panopticon is, architecture actually is um, an architecture where there is a central monitoring um, place that can monitor a whole lot of, in this case, uh, cell rows, rows of cells, which was the original idea, to make cheaper jails. 
a panopticonic architecture was built. And actually, this is a perfect equivalent to our society which we've be, which we, uh, which we're living in. And we can we can see witnesses of this um, ever called a, a service desk. And the guy goes like, hi, Mr. Philippe, uh, um, how are, it seems to be uh, having a problem with your ADSL line. Uh, we can fix this. Just the way that he knows I'm having a problem and, you know, that my name is Philippe. This is good for customer relationships, but there's also is this very small, insignificant indication that the world we're living into is knowing who we are. And you can be very much afraid of this or simply embrace it because eventually it will help the quality of our life. And there will be huge privacy debates, that's for sure. And in Europe, you know, and everywhere else in the world. Um, but specifically, your privacy regulations tend to be very strict. So what's, been, what's doable in terms of technology is still being very much limited in terms of privacy regulations. Um, and finally, the, 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 the world in which we are evolving into, in which smart applications like cognitive agents are, are uh, pushing us into, is actually that we are getting to witness and work with predictive machinery. Because when you have a whole set of historical data, and when you have behavioral analysis, which is actually, you know, it's a, it's a discipline, it's a multidisciplinary uh, field of research, of course, you need social uh, science, you need to have artificial intelligence science, you need to have mathematics, you need to have IT, and so on. But these all things come together in what we call predictive inspiration machines, because right now we're no longer working, uh, we're no longer searching for results, we're looking for inspiration, inspiration that might give us ideas to improve the quality of our life. And actually, we're no longer talking about search engines, but we're talking about ID boxes. And for these ID boxes to work for, with us as humans, um, we need to accept that these aren't big brothers anymore. Uh, and that's why we'd rather prefer to call them big mothers. They know who you are, and they're here to help you. These applications are really here to help you. And Instead of being afraid of them, we should really run towards them while taking notice that there will be some privacy issues further down the road, but we'll work with that when, you know, we'll deal with that when we get there. So, basically, just take your cell phone next time and when you work with it, don't look at it as a piece of, you know, hardware you can make phone call with, but look at it as your next best friend, you know, that's waiting to have, you know, to have a soul being brought to the machine. And this is, bare, frankly, my talk, end of my talk. And um, I hope to be able to show you the soul that we've been building with our app very soon now. So thank you all.